So anyway, good afternoon and uh, welcome to uh, 1947. Um, 1947, that's my mother-in-law. She was 26 years old and uh, that was the hairstyle I guessed back in 1947. But 1947, my name is Evan Weiner. I was not born in 1947, but uh, my background's radio and TV. And uh, in this particular talk, because my background is radio and TV, I talk about Jackie Robinson, but not through my eyes. I talked about Jackie Robinson through interviews I did with Ralph Kiner, with a guy by the name of Wally Triplett, and with Larry Doby, who is the second African American who played Major League Baseball in 1947, breaking a uh, color barrier that started in 1884. And like I said, my mother-in-law, with uh, I'm not sure if that's a real picture or if she sat in a booth and took two pictures, but uh, that was the uh, style in those days. As Larry Doby, as Jackie Robinson. Jackie Robinson making his debut with the Brooklyn Dodgers on April 15th, 1947. And uh, there will be some sort of 75th celebration, not only in baseball, but uh, there will be around the United States a uh, 75th uh, anniversary celebration of Jackie Robinson putting on the Brooklyn Dodgers uniform. I'm going to ask you a question. How many Brooklyn Dodger fans are here, and how many saw Jackie play baseball back in the day? Well, you saw the Dodgers, right? So if you saw the Dodgers, chances are you saw Jackie back in the day. Oh, the suburbs. Suburbs become a big thing as families move out of cities into places like Levittown uh, in Hempstead in Nassau County. The Truman Doctrine, how to contain the Soviets. Uh, the Truman Doctrine probably applies today. How do you contain Vladimir Putin and the Russians? That was done 75 years ago. India and Pakistan became countries in 1947. Israel, the ground is laid for Israel to become a country in 1948 by the United Nations at the end of November 1947. UFOs, the UFO craze. Uh, was there or was not there a UFO flying over New Mexico back in 1947? Some people say yes, some people say no, and it's still 75 years later, people are still trying to figure out, was it or wasn't it a UFO? Henry Ford dies, Henry Ford thought every man should own a car. And Al Capone is dead. Al Capone, of course, the uh, a uh, gangster from Chicago in the 1920s and the 1930s. 1947, the miracle, the movie, the miracle on 34th Street. Uh, how many of you seen that movie? How many of you liked that movie? And it's still on today, right? You can still see it today every Christmas. And uh, they got married, uh, Liz and Phil. Uh, Princess uh, Elizabeth marries uh, Prince Philip. Uh, of, of Mountbatten fame, and uh, that was 75 years ago, and Liz is still around 75 years later. But Friday is Jackie Robinson Day around the country, 75th anniversary of him breaking the color barrier and playing for the Brooklyn Dodgers. Uh, this guy here is a guy by the name of Moses Fleetwood Walker. And he would be the last African-American to play Major League Baseball with Toledo in 1884. It would be another 63 years before an African-American would be illegally allowed to play baseball. And I say legally, and I shouldn't use the term legal. Uh, it's just that baseball owners didn't want any African-Americans or Negroes or colored players around. There were two Americas in 1947. This is the Henry Ford Museum in Detroit, which is kind of interesting given what Henry Ford was. And not only is it an automobile museum, it's also kind of a civil rights museum. And here's my wife sitting in the colored waiting room. Two waiting rooms waiting for a train. A white waiting room and a colored waiting room. And not only that, but if you were at Penn Station in New York before Penn Station was knocked down in 1963, uh, you would see separate water fountains, one for whites and one for colored, colored people only. Can't drink out of the same water fountain even in New York. 
So there are two Americas. One, a guy like me, I could walk into a front, well, I'm not sure. I'm, maybe I could walk into an entrance into a place in the front. Uh, but certainly, if you were colored, they sent you to the back of an establishment, say a restaurant, and uh, they would put you in a dark, dingy place so other people couldn't see you. And that is Jackie Robinson's world in 1947. On April 15th, Jackie Robinson, 28 years old, becomes the first African-American player in Major League Baseball. When he steps onto the field uh, in Brooklyn at Ebbets Field, how many of you went to Ebbets Field? You want, and an applaud back there too, Ebbets Field, uh, to compete for the Brooklyn Dodgers. Robinson breaks a 63-year color barrier. Uh, Moses Fleetwood Walker was a catcher. He made his debut in the American Association, one of two major leagues back in 1894, as a catcher for the Toledo Blue Stockings in a game against uh, Louisville and the Eclipse Squad. Uh, the Chicago White Stockings of the National League played a game in Toledo in 1883. It was an exhibition game so they could make some money. But the uh, captain of the Chicago White Stockings baseball team, Cap Anson, he wasn't too happy. Why? Toledo had a colored player out there. And he refused to take the field against a team that fielded a colored player. Except they said, hey, Cap, you know what? If you forfeit this game because we have this guy on the team, he ain't going to make any money. So you either play or you don't play. We get the win by forfeit, and you don't get any money out of it. Well, Cap Anson reluctantly played the game against the colored player because he didn't want to lose money. And as everybody knows, when money talks, nobody walks. But he made a vow. Never again would he be on the same baseball field as a colored player. And there is Cap Anson, who was one of the great baseball players of the 1880s. Uh, so he goes on the field, plays the game, and says, never again, never again. So he was very vocal, both on the field and off the field. You got to keep baseball segregated. Got to keep it segregated. But baseball was no different than most other institutions back in the days. Uh, in those days, keep it segregated, keep women out of it, because we don't want women around either. Uh, but Anson was considered the father of segregated baseball. Moses Walker played 42 games in, in 1894, and he was joined by his brother, Weldon, who played a few games for Toledo in the outfield. But their careers are effectively over by the end of 1884. There was a gentleman's agreement. No real agreement, nothing legally put down, just a handshake. We're going to keep colors out of the game. By 1887, black players like Walker would lose their place in baseball. In 1887, Major League and Minor League Baseball team owners adopted this secretive gentleman's agreement or an unwritten rule that said no contracts would be given to black players. Uh, it was similar to Jim Crow laws in the South. Uh, and some of those laws adopted by southern states, and basically all black players are gone by, from Major League and Minor League Baseball by 1900. Anson had an ally. How many of you grew up in New York City? Or the New York City area? How many of you remember the Spalding Ball? The Spalding, right? Spalding. Spalding, Spalding right? Pink ball, right? Used it for punch ball. Used it for stick ball. Used it for stoop ball. Handball. And handball. How many played stoop ball? <laughs> played stoop ball? You had to throw the ball at the edge so it goes somewhere. Took a little talent. I had none doing it. But there were guys who could hit that stoop and that ball would go 100 feet. And uh, stick ball. How many of you hit more than two sewers? My husband. Your husband. husband. More than two sewers. Anyway, this guy, A.G. Spaulding, he was a baseball player. But more importantly, he was a sporting goods manufacturer and distributor, and he's Anson's ally to keep blacks out of baseball. The American League, the National League, and the predecessor, called the American Association, along with the minor leagues, uh, had a color barrier. It was up from 1890 to 19, 1946. 
There was never any formal decree keeping African Americans out of organized baseball, but Africans were clearly not wanted on the field, nor were they wanted in the stands. In fact, some places like St. Louis and Philadelphia had a little area uh, out in the outfield where they sold some tickets to African Americans. So, a number of African American players, like a guy I knew, Ray Dandridge, played in Mexico or played in Cuba. As Ray told me, that's where I made money. I had a good time in Mexico. I had a good time in Cuba. They wouldn't let me play in the United States. This guy's Charlie Grant. Charlie Grant was a light skinned black man from Chicago. And John J. McGraw was the manager of the Baltimore Orioles. He would later go on to the New York Giants as their manager. And he wanted to give Charlie Grant a tryout. Um, so he's going to pass Charlie off as a Native American. Grant had played uh, for semi-pro teams around the Chicago area. It was pretty good. And he's invited for a workout by McGraw, who's the manager of the Baltimore Orioles in the American League. Uh, McGraw said, uh, hey, this guy's a Cherokee. He's an Indian. He's a Native American. His real name, Charlie Tokumhama. Well, his real name was Charlie Grant because uh, the Chicago White Sox owner, Charles Comiskey, knew of Grant. And he said, he blew up the plan. Can't have him. This guy, Rube Foster, in 1920, was a baseball player, businessman. And he puts together the Negro Baseball League. Uh, he is the owner of the all-black Chicago American Giants, Gi Chicago American Giants, and he founds the Negro National League. This starts the Negro Leagues, and mostly in the north because there's a population base, and also he's playing in some major league stadiums. He's also playing uh, some games in uh, Patterson, New Jersey. They're rebuilding uh, the old Hitchcliffe Stadium in uh, Patterson, and I think there's going to be a little Negro League, Baseball League Museum as part of uh, what they're doing over at Patterson. Uh, there are a bunch of Negro Leagues that start out. Some are profitable, some aren't. Sam Lacey is a guy I met in the 1980s when I was a young guy uh, in my 20s covering uh, baseball at the time, and he was with a uh, newspaper in Baltimore, a uh, black newspaper in Baltimore. And Sam Lacey is one of the guys who starts talking about why aren't there black players or Negro players in baseball in the 1930s. In fact, it was 1936 that Lacey started to talk to Clark Griffith, who was the uh, owner of the Washington Senators and also owned uh, Griffith Stadium, which is now part of, well, it's gone, but it was on land that is now part of Howard University, all black school in Washington. And uh, so he, he starts lobbying Griffith and says, hey, you know what? You got some players playing in your ballpark. They're playing for the Negro League Homestead Grays, who can really make Washington a good, good team. Uh, Lacey finally gets a chance to talk to Griffith in 1937. He said, I use the old cliche about Washington being first in war, first in peace last in the American League, which wasn't exactly true because they were in the uh, 1933 World Series. But he can remedy that, uh, but he said the climate wasn't right for us to desegregate. He pointed out there were a lot of Southern players in the league, and there would be constant confrontations between the Southern players and the black players, and also there was a monetary thing involved with this because he was making money off of the Negro League teams. And if you break up the Negro Leagues, they don't play games in Washington, he makes no money off of it. Wendell Smith is the guy who allegedly was the, the conduit between Jackie Robinson and Branch Rickey, who's the general manager of the Brooklyn Dodgers, who would ultimately sign Jackie Robinson. But uh, there were a number of things going on before Wendell Smith gets a hold of Branch Rickey and says, take a look at this guy, Jackie Robinson. But Smith is credited with recommending Jackie to the uh, Dodgers general manager who is looking for a guy with strong character to successfully uh, execute the integration of baseball. Now, Ralph Kiner, how many of you remember Ralph Kiner as the Mets announcer? Yeah. Yeah. I loved Ralph. I knew Ralph. I loved Ralph. I used to sit around. He would tell stories. They were great. He told lots and lots of stories, and some of them were probably true. Anyway, 
Ralph and I were talking about Jackie Robinson one day, and he was telling me, he said, you know, there was uh, something, and Ralph wasn't stupid. Ralph played stupid on TV, but he wasn't stupid at all. And Ralph dated Elizabeth Taylor, and he said that uh, when he went out with, that was the worst date he ever had on his life. I said, why is that? He said, there was a vacancy side right here. Uh -huh. oh, Next door funny. neighbors to Phil Harris and Alice Faye, remember them? <laughs> Alice Faye and Phil Harris. Anyway, he said there was a movement going on in baseball and out of baseball to desegregate the games. Now, here's a protest in New York. Uh, admit Negroes to big league baseball. And they also wanted some more gyms at uh, schools in New York. But uh, that was one of the protests. Unions and civil rights groups picketed outside the Yankee Stadium and the polo grounds and Ebbets Field in New York City, in Comiskey Park, in Wrigley Field in Chicago. And they got more than a million signatures on petitions demanding that baseball tear down the color barrier. Anybody here go to the New York World's Fair in 1939, 1940? You were there, you were there. You probably don't remember this. But in July of 1940, the Trade Union Athletic Association held an end Jim Crow in baseball demonstration at the 1940 portion of the World's Fair over in uh, Flushing Meadows. Uh, this is the Wizard of Oz. Actually, he's the commissioner of baseball, Kenneth Sore Mountain Landis. But how many of you remember when Dorothy and the gang found the Wizard of Oz and they accidentally pulled the curtain? And what happened when they pulled the curtain? Oz was just a regular guy, right? That's all he was. He had no special powers. And uh, this guy also. The uh, uh, the commissioner of baseball, Kenneth Sewer, Matt Landis. Now, he was brought into baseball around 1920-21 to basically clean up the game after the gambling scandal with the Chicago White Sox in 1919. He also helped baseball get its, base, its antitrust exemption along the way by being one of the judges who ruled against the Mer Maryland Terrapins Federal League baseball team that wanted to get into Major League Baseball and get a settlement for going out of business. Uh, so he's supposed to be almighty. Uh, the petitions asked fans if they would be uh, willing to allow the Yankees, Dodgers, or Giants to sign a black player after he made the team. After a year and a half, they had over a million and a half signatures on Judge Landis's desk. When Landis was asked point blank, about whether or not the game should desegregate, he said, it's not my decision. <laughs> hey, you're supposed to be the all-powerful commissioner. You're supposed to wave your wand, right? Never happened. Now, World War II breaks out. December 7, 1941, the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor. Uh, between 1941, by the way, Hank Greenberg was the first major league player to uh, re-enlist, I guess, because he came out of the Army, but he re-enlisted on December 8, 1941, to fight the Nazis. But more than a million black Americans served their country in World War II. Many of the military units were segregated, but some played, some blacks played on integrated baseball teams while overseas. Um, it wasn't totally true that there was no integration. For the Battle of the Bulge, Eisenhower needed more troops in 44 and 45, so he on his own integrated um, the armed forces just for that. This is an ad. This was an ad put up by the uh, Brook uh, by the Harlem City Council pre uh, city Harlem City Councilman Ben Davis, who's a communist by the way, and uh, he wants desegregation. There is a political movement going on in New York to desegregate. Major League Baseball. The ad is enough. There's a dead soldier here, black soldier, and there's a baseball pitcher, black baseball pitcher here. And it says, good enough to die, but not good enough to pitch. <laughs> Running for re-election for the New York City Council in 1945, Ben Davis, an African-American former college football star and a communist, distributed a leaflet with the photos of two blacks a dead soldier and a baseball player. Good enough to die for his country, but not good enough to pitch. And Ralph Kiner talked about that with me. Here's Ben Davis, who ended up in jail in 1952 because he was a communist, trying to overthrow the government. Uh, also, up in Albany, New York State Legislature passed 
The Quinn Ives Act, which banned discrimination in hiring and soon formed a committee to investigate discriminatory hiring practices, including one that focused on baseball. See, it was Ralph Kiner who pointed all that out to me. And I got that information on my uh, looking it up, but it was Ralph who talked about the movement that was going on to desegregate the game. And there is Ralph in his Pittsburgh Pirates uh, uniform, Kiner's Corner. Some of you Mets fans might remember Kiner's Corner on TV after games. They were great, because Ralph had a couple drinks in him by the time he was doing the game, that part of the broadcast, but Ralph, Ralph was all aces as far as I was concerned. Really nice guy. And like I said, he said that there was vacancy up here with Elizabeth Taylor. Anyway, this is Ralph. It was just another part of the changeover of baseball. It had to happen sooner or later. It's really an aftermath of World War II where black players or Negroes fought for our side. They had to be recognized. There was a movement at the time. They were going to bring black players into the game. The, uh, the Branch Rickey, who Ralph hated. He was his boss in Pittsburgh. Ralph absolutely hated him. So he wouldn't give Ralph a raise, even though he was hitting home runs and leading the major leagues in home runs were the National League. Anyway, Ricky was the man who picked Robinson, and that was a brilliant choice. Larry Doby sat down with a lengthy, or did a lengthy interview with Larry Doby in 1997. It was the 50th anniversary of Jackie Robinson breaking the color barrier, as well as his 50th anniversary. But Larry Doby isn't remembered the way Jackie Robinson was, because Jackie was number one. This is Larry Doby talking, not me, Larry Doby. Mr. Ricky, Mr. Robinson, Mr. Veck, Bill Veck, the owner of the Cleveland Indians, gave me an opportunity to be in the American League. So I have to say that if Jackie had not made it, I probably would not have been given the opportunity. When you talk about what goes through your mind 50 years ago, you have to think of Mr. Ricky. I had the courage to do it. And you think about Mr. Robinson, who had the courage to do it? And you think about Mr. Vec, who had the courage to do it? And me, who had the opportunity to do it. And there is Bill Vec, and there is Larry Doby. A lot of people ask me, Jack gets a lot of the headlines. And you don't get too much headlines. Both Robinson and Doby were basically in the same boat. They were ver verbally abused. They had to live a separate life on the road from their teammates because of, anybody here see the movie The Green Book? Yeah. The Green Book. Green Book was put out by Victor Green in Harlem. It was a motorist guide to where you could buy gas, go to restaurants, go to hotels, and be safe. Same with these guys. They had to go to the other side of town in their neighborhood. Uh, and the poorer side of town, that's where they lived. When a guy is first, you should get the headlines. I know myself, my friends. My friends know I was involved in the same type of thing he was involved in. And there they are in 1947. I'm not going to go around asking for publicity, politicking for publicity, but I know what I've done. And I know I've helped some people to accomplish what they have done in terms of coming into the American League. It makes you feel good being part of it. That's the thing nobody can take away from me. A lot of people think because I was 11 weeks behind Jackie, made it easier for me. It's not true. We talked about it. I would not say we were close from a social standpoint, but we barnstormed about four years 30 days, for 30 days. I'd see him at certain functions, but we stayed away from the negatives. There they are again. The uh, only thing we talked about, there were certain guys who gave him a tough time. I had certain guys in the American League that gave me a tough time. You see, the focus was trying to be the best ball player you could be. And uh, you had to be because when you're talking about eight teams, you know, you get hurt and uh, you might get back. Uh, you had to concentrate, playing the game as well as you can. And one of the things, I think he felt the same way. Um, why stir up things? It's tough enough going through the summer going through what you're going through, uh, you don't want to go to talk about the same thing during the winter. Let's talk about something positive. Let's be comfortable. Let's be happy. This guy, Wally Triplett, passed away about a year, year and a half ago. 
We became friends when he was in his 80s. I'm not sure how we became friends, but we became pen pals. And we talked to each other, and finally I talked to him on the phone one day. He was in Detroit. And uh, Wally Triplett was Jackie Robinson's pinochle competitor when they played pinochle together. And he also ate the same colored greens that Jackie did at his parents' house. Wally Triplett was a chauffeur, confidant, card-playing buddy of Robinson, made sure that Jackie always got a home-cooked meal when the Dodgers and Robinson played in Philadelphia uh, against the Phillies. Philadelphia was probably the toughest place to play in all of baseball for Robinson, but Wally Triplett and his family always made it easier for Jackie and provided an oasis away from the pressures that Robinson was facing. Wally talking here. Philadelphia was the worst team in the league for taunting. Uh, Triplett was also a sports pioneer in his own right. First African-American player on the Penn State football team. One of the first African-American players to ever play college football in Texas, in the game uh, in Texas. Um, Philadelphia is where they threw the black cat on the field when Robinson played. There is uh, Jackie Robinson, and then there is Ben Chapman. Ben Chapman was the manager of the Philadelphia Phillies. And Ben Chapman threw all sorts of insults, all sorts of insults Jackie's way. But Ben Chapman said it was just part of the baseball. After all, when Hank Greenberg was around, I called him a Jew bastard. I called him a kike. I called him a he. When Joe DiMaggio was around, I called him a dago. I called him a wop. What's the big deal? That was what we did in baseball back in those days. Uh, he made it uh, clear that he was opposed to Jackie being around. He'd throw out the insults from the dugout and told his pitchers, throw out Jackie's head if it's a 3-0 count, rather than walk him. Chapman's antics uh, caused many in baseball to sympathize with Robinson. If you go to Brooklyn, you go to a minor league Brooklyn Cyclones game, you will see this statue outside of the little stadium in Coney Island. It's a statue of Pee Wee Reese putting his arm around Jackie Robinson. Now there's some question as to whether or not that actually happened on the baseball field. Jackie never said anything, Pee Wee never said anything. But there were people who saw it, Pee Wee Reese put his arm around Jackie Robinson, welcoming him to the club on the field after a tough outing. Robinson went on to say that the Chapman-led racism actually helped bring the Dodgers team closer together. Perhaps Pee Wee Reese put his arm around Jackie, the Dodgers shortstop, in the following game. Maybe not. But the Dodgers would go 94, or rather 94 and 60 that year, and Robinson would win the Rookie of the Year award, and the team reached the World Series. Um, newspapers didn't give too many accounts of Jackie Robinson once he played. It's kind of a forgotten thing that he broke the color barrier. Not too many accounts about Robinson in various newspapers. This is a guy named Joe Tepsik. Played with Brooklyn Dodgers in 1946. And Wally Triplett was friends with him. In a weird way. They were teammates playing college football at Penn State University. And Joe Tepsik may have kept, or may have been in the way of Jackie Robinson becoming a Dodger player in 1946. Uh, Tepsik befriended Triplett while the two were at Penn State playing football. Tepsik would sign a contract with Brooklyn, and he had a weird clause in this contract. See, he couldn't be sent down to the minor leagues in 1946. That was in his contract. Why they gave him that, I don't know. It was an unusual contract. Uh, Tepsik was a struggling player who actually wasn't very popular with his Dodger teammates while Robinson was playing AAA baseball in Montreal. This is uh, Triplett talking. Jackie signed in on October 23, 1945, and was sent to Montreal. As at Penn State, I met Tepsik. Tepsik and I became close friends. 1946, the Brooklyn manager, Leo DeRocher, wanted Jackie and asked Tepsik to go down to Montreal. Tepsik said no. Tepsik had signed with Brooklyn and had a clause in his contract that he could decline going to the minor leagues. He delayed Jackie until 1947. He would not go down. I've spoke to baseball historians and said, Wally's full of it. 
I said, why would Wally be full of it? I know he was friends with Robinson. What does he got to gain or lose by telling the story? Baseball historians don't believe the story. Here's Jackie in Montreal. According to accounts available from 1946, like I said, there aren't that many newspaper accounts about Jackie, uh, Tepsic's teammates were hoping he would accept the devotion and the team would pick up a veteran pinch hitter. There is no indication that Brooklyn would have added Robinson, but Triplett said DeRocher wanted Jackie. And there's Jackie signing in 1945. Jackie makes his major league debut on April 15th. He would uh, soon afterward uh, become friendly with Triplett. Wally had been around baseball as a kid. His father worked for Ed Bolden's Philadelphia Stars Negro League team. Um, he knew Satchel Page and others through his association with his father. He struck up a conversation with Robinson one day after a game, and he took him home. He would do the same for Major League Baseball's second Negro player, Larry Dobin. Philadelphia had a team, uh, Philadelphia had teams in the American League and the National League. Uh, so they played Cleveland. They played Brooklyn, where they came through the city. Uh, with the Phillies in the National League and the A's in the American League, Connie Mack, the owner of the Philadelphia A's, wasn't too keen on allowing Negroes into a stadium, not just on the field, but in the stands to watch the A's. Jackie, I took Jackie home, said Triplett. Let's kill some time. My mother cooked him special rolls and greens for him. My mother fell in love with him. Triplett said, Robinson, he's a nice guy. Branch Rickey selected Jackie because he knew he could withstand the guff. He was a nice person. We used to play pinochle all night. And then I'd drive him back to the hotel. He always got a meal from my mother. So why was Jackie Robinson number one? Why not Larry Doby? Why not Satchel Paige, who was a very well-known Negro League pitcher at that time? Well, Wally Triplett has his theory. Uh, Triplett uh, has some insight. He knew all of them. And he said that uh, Jackie was a good diplomat. Larry Doby thought he should have been the first, but Doby wasn't as bubbly a personality as Satchel. In fact, Doby and Satchel were on the same Cleveland team, and Doby didn't really like him. And he was more matter-of-fact in personality than Jack. Meanwhile, that's Wally in the Cotton Bowl, January 1st, 1948. 1947 football season, Penn State is invited to play in the Cotton Bowl against Southern Methodist University. Uh, but there's a problem. Uh, Robinson's Philadelphia friend Triplett and his uh, Penn State teammate Dennis Hoggard were told Cotton Bowl officials in Dallas, Texas, they didn't want you to play because you're Negroes uh, in the January 1st, 1948 game. Penn State players, led by Steve Suey, who was the captain, said, we all go or none of us go. We're Penn State and the Negro players were part of the team. Uh, SMU came up with a suggestion, stay at the Dallas Naval Air Station, even though, even though the armed forces were not desegregated. Penn State accepted, practiced at the military institution, and played the game. Levittown. How many know of Levittown or even lived at Levittown? Anybody live at Levittown? You lived at Levittown? No, just knew them. Had friends there at Levittown? Well, the war has ended. The war has ended. And uh, the GIs that come home, they need a place to live. Uh, American men had spent years away from their wives and their girlfriends because of World War II. Marriages soared in the post-war era. Many couples uh, decided it was an ideal time to start a family. Actually, if you do the math, the baby boomers start in June of 1946. You go nine months backwards, at Operation Magic Carpet, guys started coming home on September 6, 1945. Do the math nine months later, and you'll figure out why the baby boom started. Anyway, many couples decided it was an ideal time to uh, begin a family, and an unusually high number of children were born. How many baby boomers are in here? You have to be born after 1946 to be a baby boomer. 
Suburbs emerged as a popular place to live. These prefabricated homes just outside the city limits, over one million veterans enrolled in college through the GI Bill. How many of you benefited with your husbands going, getting the GI Bill? My brother. Your brother. My husband. Your husband. And you also got loans, right? Mm -hmm. You also got loans. The Veterans Administration and the Federal Housing Administration guaranteed builders that qualified veterans could buy housing for a fraction of rental costs. Abraham Levitt built subdivisions on Long Island. He would later uh, take both of his sons, taking in both of his sons, William and his architect brother Alfred, into his Levitt and Sons business. And that is William Levitt. He's the salesman. He's the guy thinking about marketing. Alfred was pragmatic. While uh, building airfields uh, for the Navy during the war, he experimented with various methods of construction and eliminated the glacial lumbering approach that most builders erecting four or five homes a year took. Uh, William Levin, he's the entrepreneur, uh, knew that the end of the war would bring a surge in business. Uh, the government anticipated five million homes would be needed to accommodate rising marriage and birth rates. Before he deployed Levitt, William Levitt, bought uh, or took out an option on some land in Hempstead on Long Island, Nassau County. When he returned, he set about completing the largest housing project in American history. Mm -hmm. And they all look the same. And you go there today, they all look the same all these years later. In fact, uh, if you bought a place there and you might have been a little tipsy coming home, you might go down the wrong street thinking it was your house because they all look the same, put your key in, and it wasn't your house. Your house was three blocks from here. Oh, I'm so sorry. Potential buyers, Levitt knew, wanted to spend roughly twice their annual salary, about $3,800 a year on a home, $7,500 for a home. Expensive housing and strict lending terms had kept many families and apartments from living with parents to save up for down payments. By streamlining the building process, Levitt could offer both affordability and quality. The Levitt houses started to be built in July of 1947. The first buyers were in three months later. There would be four Levittown communities, Hempstead, New Jersey, Pennsylvania and Puerto Rico of all places. Puerto Rico, the American territory. They all look the same. And the cars all look the same. A clause in the original Levittown Covenant prevented tenants from allowing non-Caucasian to use or occupy Levitt homes, just like it was in Bronxville. If you wanted to sell a home back in the day when Joe Kennedy was putting together Bronxville, which was in the 20s and 30s. John Kennedy grew up in Bronxville. Yes. He did not grow up in Massachusetts. Yes. Teddy Kennedy grew up in Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. Bobby Kennedy grew up in Bronxville. So they were not fully Massachusettsites. Uh, and Ted Kennedy married uh, Joan, who is in Bronxville, <laughs> all nine-tenths of a mile from where I live. Anyway, so uh, Supreme Court of the United States, 1926, in the case Cargan against Buckley, ruled that Racially restrictive covenants were legal binding documents. In Bronxville, you sold your house to a society, and then they picked out who was going to buy the house. Uh, you couldn't sell your house directly because of a covenant. Um, so covenants were legally binding documents that could prevent the selling of houses to blacks. Black veterans were unable to purchase homes. Again, Jackie Robinson's uh, 1947, and the Levitts justified the clause by stating that it maintained the value of the property since most whites at that time preferred not to live in mixed communities. Sell to a Negro and the values go down. Freedom Ride. 1946, buses were supposed to be segregated. This is 1947. The journey of the reconciliation, the first Freedom Ride. The first Freedom Ride did not take place in 1961. It took place in 1947. The Fellowship for, of Reconciliation and the Congress of Racial Equality, or CORE, organized the bus ride to test the implementation of a Supreme Court ruling in favor of Irene Morgan in 1946 
after she was thrown off a bus going from Maryland to Virginia on July 16, 1944. Morgan refused to give up her seat to a white person and was arrested. She had been charged with resisting arrest and violating Virginia's Jim Crow transit law. What she was doing, she was coming home from a gynecologist, or well, she had done a gynecologist visit because she had a miscarriage and she felt well enough to see her family. She was on the bus and she refused to give up her seat. She was thrown off and arrested. So, here's the Freedom Ride. Uh, Court sent 16 white and black members on, a southbound, on southbound buses out of Washington, D.C. Their journey of reconciliation began on April 9, 1947, and protested Southern states' illegal segregation. To educate the public about the case, writers say, get on the bus, sit any place, because Irene Morgan won her case. You don't have to ride Jim Crow. There were arrests, even though the Morgan case was decided. Their itineraries ended in North Carolina when they were taken into custody and were prosecuted for disturbing the peace. Truman decides in 1946, time for a president commission on civil rights. And he said, I want our Bill of Rights implemented in fact. We've been trying to do this 150 years. We're making progress, but we're not making progress fast enough. In 1947, the committee released its import, report entitled, To Secure These Rights. It documented nationwide discrimination in areas such as education, housing, public accommodations, and voting rights. Truman Doctrine, 1947, contained the Soviets. 2022, get the Russians out of Ukraine. 75 years, nothing's changed, has it? Truman document, Doctrine. The Truman Doctrine is an American foreign policy uh, which primary goal was to contain Soviet geopolitical expansion during the Cold War. It was announced to Congress by Truman on March 12th. Truman told Congress, it must be the policy of the United States to support free peoples who are resisting attempted subjugation by armed minorities by outside pressures. Truman contended that because of totalitarian regimes uh, coerced free peoples, they automatically represented a threat to international peace and the national security of the United States. Stalin and the USSR. The Americans were particularly interested in what was going on in Greece in 1947 and whether there would be a communist revolt in Greece because there was a civil war going on. The U.S. government believed that the Soviet Union supported the Greek Communists' war uh, effort and worried that if the Communists prevailed in the Greek Civil War, the Soviets would ultimately influence uh, Greek policy. But Stalin stayed away from it. But he had a proxy who was going to do it, the Yugoslavian Prime Minister Joseph Tito. But uh, this would start the strained relationship between Yugoslavia and the Soviet Union. National Security Act. Well, it was done in 1947 and it has profound implications still in 2022. National Security Act of 1947 mandated a major renovation of the foreign policy and military establishments of the U.S. government. Uh, that act created many of the institutions that presidents <laughs> found useful when formulating in implementing foreign policy, including the National Security Council. It also created the Central Intelligence Agency, or the CIA. Executive Order 9835, a loyalty oath. If you were employed by the federal government, you had to take a loyalty oath. And this comes down on March 21st. And uh, want a job with the federal government? You better swear that you're loyal. Truman indicated that he expected all federal workers to demonstrate complete and unswerving loyalty to the United States. Anything less constitutes a threat to our democratic process. Meanwhile, there's the Red Scare. That starts in 1946 in Hollywood in earnest. It's Billy Wilkerson, and he publishes The Hollywood Reporter, and he names names of communists in Hollywood. Doesn't have any proof, but 
hey, he's going to do it anyway. Um, July 1946, Billy Wilkerson, the Hollywood reporter, owner, editor, and publisher, started to expose communists working in Hollywood. He would name the alleged Reds in his trade view column, exposing this lurking menace. <coughs> On July 29, Wilkerson published trade views, a column that included the names Dalton, Dalton Trumbo, Howard Koch, and nine other Hollywood players the editor branded as communist sympathizers. Wilkerson began to ruin lives. This guy also tried to ruin lives. Walt Disney, hunting for communists in 1941. He branded some of his former animators communists, said the Screen Actors Guild was a communist front and labeled a 1941 strike at his studio a uh, communist plot. He even contacted the FBI about alleged communist infiltration. And Ronald Reagan ends up on Capitol Hill in 1947 for the first time testifying before Congress. He is the president of the Screen Actors Guild. On October 20th, members of the House and Un American Activities began an investigation into alleged communist influences in the film industry. Lauren Bacall, Humphrey Bogart, Gene Kelly, who we found out later was paying for arms for the uh, Irish Republican Army, and John Huston signed a petition denouncing the committee as Un American itself for probing the politics of individual citizens. Reagan testified that a, sm a small clique of communists had attempted uh, to be a disruptive influence within the Screen Actors Guild. Well, one of the Hollywood 11 <laughs> turned evidence, so it became the Hollywood 10. In November 1947, 10 screenwriters and directors refused to testify, arguing that the First Amendment of the U.S. Constitution guaranteed the freedom to belong to any political organization they chose. Ten, Alvi Besser, Bessie, Alvi Bessie, Herbert Bieberman, Lester Cole, Edward Dimitri, Ring Lardner Jr., I know his son Rex, John uh, Howard Lawson, Albert Waltz, Samuel Ornitz, Adrian Scott, Dalton Trumbo. Well, they would refuse to testify before Congress, and you know, when you refuse to testify before Congress and you get a contempt of Congress charge against you, you end up in jail like those guys did, for one year. Sometimes that happens. Seems not happening in 2022. India and Pakistan, well, they're independent countries. They're carved out of uh, nations, uh, or carved out of the former Mongol Empire on August 15th. It ended 200 years of British rule, hailed by Gandhi as the noblest act of the British nation. But there was religious strife between Hindus and Muslims which uh, delayed uh, the uh, British granting of independence till after World War II. And in Punjab, uh, which was divided between Hindus and Muslims, hundreds of people were killed in the days after independence. The creation of Israel dates back to November 29, 1947. Because on that day, the United Nations voted to allow the creation of the Jewish state. After close to three decades, the Balfour Declaration, 1917, and I have a friend by the name of uh, Bob Friedman, who's a professor at John Hopkins University, um, and uh, he was an advisor to various prime ministers of Israel, including uh, Yitzhak Rabin, met with Arafat, and we are talking about this one day, and he said the Balfour Declaration actually set the stage for now more than a century of problems between the two sides because the British tried to appease everybody and appease nobody. Anyway, uh, the United Nations proposed to split the area into uh, two states, uh, forming independent Arab and Jewish states. The Jews accepted the UN resolution, the Arabs did not. Uh, under the resolution, the uh, religious significant areas around Jerusalem would remain un under international control administered by the UN. The Palestinian Arabs refused to uh, recognize this arrangement. They said it's, un it's favorable to the Jews, not fair to the Arabs, uh, who remained in the Jewish territory under the partition. The United States was seeking a middle way. It still is seeking a middle way. Direct negotiations between the Arabs and the Jews in the Middle East. That's been going on for almost 76 years now. 75 years now. 
Truman supported the creation of Israel, as did Stalin. Uh, war crimes. The Japanese uh, Emperor Hirohito, they spare him. Uh, they didn't spare Tojo or others. On May 3rd, the uh, Japanese post-war constitution goes into effect. The progressive uh, constitution granted universal suffrage. Everybody could vote. Stripped the Emperor Hirohito of all but symbolic power, stipulated the Bill of Rights, abolished peerage, and outlawed Japan's right to make war. How many of you read the Diary of a Young Girl or the Diary of Anne Frank? What did you think of the book? Wonderful. Wonderful book. Wonderful book. Okay, it's published in 1947. The roots go back to 1945. This is the legacy of your daughter, a helper. Meet and G's told Otto Frank when she gave him Anne's diary documents. Otto had learned that his daughters, Margot and Anne, had died of spotted typhus in Bergen-Belsen, the concentration camp. What I read in her book is so indescribably captivating that I just have to keep reading, said Otto Frank. He sends a letter to his sister on September 26, 1945, uh, saying that and other things. At first, Otto couldn't read Anne's text. I don't have the strength to read them, he wrote to his mother on August 22, 1945. A month later, he changed his mind and could not put them down. Otto decided to copy excerpts for his relatives in Basel, Sweden, and started working on the translation in German. Mm -hmm. Otto's expert excerpts were not read by just his relatives, but his friends as well. And they told him, this is important. This is an important human document, and that Otto can't keep it to himself. It took some time to agree with them. By 1947, it was not easy to find the publisher because nobody wanted to look backwards. Wanted to look forwards. And that's the book, The Diary of a Young Girl. It was never The Diary of Anne Frank. It was The Diary of a Young Girl. The book was published five years after Anne's 13th birthday, the day she received her diary. She came up with the title of the book herself, Het Atahus, The Secret Addicts. Unions uh, in the United States take a step backwards in 1947 with uh, the Taft-Hartley Act. What happened in 1946, the GIs came home. They wanted jobs, and they wanted to be paid fairly. After all, they put their lives on the line for about three and a half years. The Labor Management Relation Act of 1947, Taft-Hartley Act, United States federal law that restricts activities and power of labor unions. It was enacted by the 80th Congress of the United States over a veto by Harry Truman, who thought it was a bad law. The beginning of the war on labor starts with the Taft-Hartley Act. This guy was not a Facebook expert on polio. He was the real deal. His name, John Assault. And in 1947, uh, he's appointed the director of the Virus Research uh, Laboratory at the University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine with funding from the National Foundation for Infantile Paralysis, known as the March of Dimes Birth Defects Foundation. He began to develop the techniques that would lead to a vaccine to wipe out the frightening scourge of the time called polio. How many of you had a polio shot? You all did. You all did. Oh, UFO over New Mexico, Roswell. Sometime between June and July, a rancher by the name of W.W. Mac Brazel found wreckage on his property in Lincoln County, New Mexico, 75 miles of uh, Roswell. Uh, flying discs, flying sources, that was the rage in the summer of 1947. And Brazel thought, hey, I think I found it. Look at this, rubber strips, tin foil, thick paper. And might be, might be, might be. Headlines, Army discounts. New Mexico finds his weather gear. Initially, they thought, yeah, it was a UFO. He brings some of the material to the sheriff, uh, George Wilcox of Roswell, and they bring it to the attention of the Colonel William Blanchard, uh, the commanding officer of the Roswell Army Airfield. The next day, the airfield releases a statement. The many rumors regarding flying discs became a reality yesterday when the intelligence office of the 509th Bomb Group of the 8th Air Force, Roswell Army Field, was fortunate enough to gain possession of a disc through the cooperation 
of the local ranchers, one of the local ranchers in the sheriff's county of Chavez County. The following day, they recanted it, saying, eh, you know what, it's just a weather balloon. And uh, they released a picture of uh, Major Jesse Marcel with pieces of the broken weather balloon. Henry Ford dies. Here I am with my wife at the Henry Ford Museum. He dies on April 7th. On June 16th, 1903, Henry Ford and 12 others invested $28,000, which would be millions of dollars today, to create the Ford Moto Company. Uh, the first car built was sold on July 15th, 1903. Model T introduced October 1908. In 19 years, the Model T sold more than 15 million cars in the U.S., more than a million in Canada, a quarter of a million in Great Britain. Ford uh, said that uh, everybody should own the car. And he paid his workers to the point where they could afford the car. Should not be a rich man's luxury. Of course, he got rich because it was an everyday car. Capone is dead on October 31st, 1931. He was arrested, sent to 11 years in prison for tax evasion, and fined $80,000. That would be at the end of the Capone syndicate in Chicago of the 20s and 30s. But he was sent to Alcatraz, as was I on my honeymoon. I went to Alcatraz on my honeymoon. Uh, Capone uh, served some time at the U.S. Penitentiary in Atlanta, but uh, they thought he was getting favorable treatment, so they sent him to The Rock in Alcatraz. Uh, he got out early in 1939 on good behavior. He was being uh, affected by syphilis at that point. He died on January 25th in uh, Palm Island, Florida at the age of 48. As we come to an end here, the, middle, the oh, movie, The Miracle, you, you like the movie, right? <laughs> the cute. Miracle on 34th Street. The American Christmas comedy drama, 20th Century Fox released it, written and directed by George <laughs> Seaton, based on the story by Valentine Davies, starred Maureen O'Hara, John Payne, a very young Natalie Wood, kid, and uh, Edward Gwen, the story takes place between Thanksgiving and Christmas Day in New York City. It focuses on the effect of a department store, Santa Claus, who claims to be the real Santa. Uh, it won three Academy Awards. Best actor in the supporting role went to Gwen. Uh, Davies got the best writing original story, and George Seaton, best writing screenplay. Liz gets married. She's still around and apparently has survived COVID. She is the only person in this talk who is still around from 1947. Everybody else I've spoken about is long gone. She's still around. She marries a Philip Mountbatten, Mountbatten, Duke of Edinburgh. She would later become Quisimit, uh, Quisimit, Queen Elizabeth II, and he becomes Prince Philip. The 1947 legacy, there's Larry Dobin, second uh, Negro player in baseball, second Negro manager, following a guy by the name of Robinson, Frank Robinson. Uh, 47 legacy, Jackie Robinson made my success possible, said the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Without him, I would never have been able to do what I did. In 1948, in the Shelley versus Kramer case, Supreme Court of the United States struck down racially restrictive housing covenants uh, as they violated the 14th Amendment and the Levittown uh, Clause was eliminated. Truman desegregated the military in 1948. They talk about Robinson and Dobie. Uh, on June 3rd, 1978, Chicago White Sox owner Bill Beck, who owned the Cleveland Indians 30 years earlier, signed Larry Dobie as his manager. Uh, Wally Triplett would become the first Negro to be drafted by a team in the National Football League to make a roster. He played two years in Detroit, 49-50, went to Korea in 51, traded to the Chicago Cardinals where he played in 52-53, went back to Detroit, and we became friendly. He was an eyewitness to history. But he also, uh, he also talked about this. In one sense, it was a lot of fun, but we also wondered, what did we miss? 1947, Truman and Stalin. The Cold War would finally sort of end. 
as the Soviet Union fell in 1991, but problems between the United States and the Soviet Union's successor, Soviet Russia, remain. 1995, 1998, Clinton uh, signs a series of orders, Bill Clinton repealing the Truman loyalty oath and the Dwight Eisenhower loyalty oath. Hollywood 10 did time in jail, one year for contempt, contempt of Congress. Many of the Hollywood 10 continued producing screenplays under assumed names after they were blacklisted, using the pseudonym Robert Rich Dalton Trumbo. Penned the script for The Brave One, which won an Academy Award for Best Screenplay in 1957, blacklisting would end in, 19, in the 1960s. Miracle of 34th Street, the ninth best film ever, according to the American Film Associ Institute's 100 Years. Uh, number five is uh, the mo one of the most inspiring, uh, and uh, in the fantasy genre, number 10. The Diary of a Young Girl is re regarded as one of the most important works of the 20th century. In 2005, Miracle on 34th Street was preserved by the National, United States National Film Registry by the Library of Congress because it was culturally, historically, and aesthetically significant. John Salk, well, he developed that polio vaccine and was released in 1955. Henry Ford was a terrible human being. He was a brilliant businessman. Al Capone would come back to life in the Elliot Ness book, The Untouchables, but would rarely be seen in the Desi Lou TV show, The Untouchables. 1946, the Congress, uh, the uh, city councilman, Ben Davis from Harlem, was one of 11 Communist Party leaders convicted of conspiring to teach and advocate the forcible overthrow of the United States government. He would serve three years in jail. And that was how it was in 1947. Any questions, any comments, feel free because the floor is now all yours.